What's happening, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. This is Bunk Bed Breakdowns, BDGE's very own Dynasty show. My name is Noah. That is Mike, my co-host, who joins me every single Wednesday, even on the brand new channel where we will have brand new content coming out almost every single day. Mike, you worked a long, hard day today, which is why we're recording at 11 p.m. Eastern time. And it's probably going to be tomorrow by the time we're done with this. So if, if the energy isn't there from either side, I hope you guys understand that we're doing this very late and Mike has been working very hard in his actual job recently. So, but, but, but we'll, we'll give you guys our best performance. It's a Q and a, and every week going forward, actually bi-weekly, Mike and I will be hopping on the BBB channel doing Q and A's from our discord. There's a channel, I believe it's called triple B Q and a, and we'll just be picking questions at random, probably like a 10 to 20 minute video, just answering those. Every other week, every other week from those, I think it'll be on Tuesdays, we'll do either roster review or trade advice for you guys in the Discord channel. But we'll also have uh, videos on Friday and Monday. You guys will see those when they come. I don't want to overpromise and underdeliver. So uh, when they come out, you'll see if they're good or if they're bad. And you can leave feedback on that. But that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here for the Q&A. We got about 12 questions queued up. I'm not so sure if we're going to get to them before we both fall asleep. But hopefully <laughs> we knock them all out of the way. Mike, I just rambled for about two minutes. How you doing, man? I feel like you deserve I'm, to speak in this I'm intro. I'm fucking exhausted. I've uh, been working like basically 7.30 to 8 p.m. straight, so we're recording late. So Uncle Nick is asleep because he's old as fuck, so it's me and Noah running the show today. Um, you know, as, as it should be, man. This is our bunk bed breakdown. You know, we've launched a new channel. We've launched a new pod. We're coming at you with a bunch of freaking content. You know, we've uploaded a lot of the single player reviews that we did earlier in the year. Uh, I think they're still valuable to look back and go. Now you'll get to see the awesome call Noah made on CEH. Uh, we talk about a lot about the running backs, a lot about the wide receivers, a lot of the clickbait, ti clickbait titles that Noah's been putting up. Maximum clickbait, maximum views, but still big backs only. So look, man, we're going to give you a lot of content. I'm excited. I still got enough energy to put out this nice episode here. So we're going to pump out these Q and A's and uh, we're going to, we're going to hit that intro. All right. First question comes from it's bunch. He asks, what was your best trade of all time? and your worst. Mike, if you don't have an answer right now, I'll just kick it off. My worst trade of all time was prior to the season beginning. I moved Jimmy G, Terry McLaurin, and Tyler Boyd for Devontae Adams. That isn't like an awful trade, but if I knew what Terry McLaurin was going to be, I probably wouldn't have pulled the trigger on that. Uh, that super flex? It was super flex, yeah, but I oh, hate wow. Jimmy Garoppolo either way. It was, <laughs> it, was, it was tough, and Mike, you know I'm not playing any one quarterback leagues. This isn't 1934. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, true. On top of that, in a startup, I also traded Allen Robinson coming off of that bad year for Hollywood Brown, Jay Sternberger, and Chase Edmond. So it goes without being said that that was not one of my prettier deals. Mike, do you have any off the top of your head where you just got absolutely shafted? Dude, if, that, if that's your worst trade, I'm about to put you away right here. So uh, before the season started, um, I think this was like before like the Melvin Gordon holdout and all this stuff, and the people thought Austin Eckler was going to be uh, good, but like still just a handcuff for the primary primary part of it. I mean, Mike. I, I traded uh, Austin Eckler and like a third round pick for Chris Herndon in a, uh, and the reason why I did it is because it's a start two tight end league. Mm -hmm. So you have to start two every week and it's a tight end premium. So it's a little bit unique scoring. And I was a big Chris Herndon believer based on what he did in his rookie year. Uh, but yeah, that was a, just a brutal, brutal trade. And I somehow still managed to win that league though. So humble bro. I, I, love that. I was flush. I was flush with running back talent. Let's just say it that way. I had, I had Saquon Barkley, I had Dalvin Cook, I had Nick Chubb. I have like I just I was just flush with running back. The craziest thing I need, is I need you traded away your best one. Yeah, exactly. I traded away my RB one, which is uh which was tilting, but uh managed to win. So hopefully I'm able to win a couple more times in that league because that's like a rolling empire pot. That yeah, was my worst you, trade. Do you have any uh best trades, trades that made people look foolish? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really have many trades that make people look foolish because I don't like the way I approach trades. I try to make it like a fair trade for the most part in, in the time. So like I pay market price and if it's a player I like, I pay above market price because I'm betting on that player to like succeed in the future. Right. So a couple examples would be, you know, before the season started, uh, I traded like Drew Locke plus Tyler Lockett plus a second for Lamar Jackson. And this was like before, before last season. Right. So Lamar Jackson's ADP was around. 
fifth round ADP. So I think I got a pretty decent deal on that uh, in a super flex. Uh, but then it just turned out to be like an amazing deal because of what Lamar Jackson turned out to be, right? Another example would be I paid uh, Chris Carson and Marlon Mack for uh, DJ Moore and Matt Breida. So this was also before the season started. So at the time, that's an overpay, right? Because Chris Carson had the workhorse role locked up, like Marlon Mack had the role locked up, and this is a points per carry league as well. So running backs are really valuable. But for me, I was like, I'm all in on DJ Moore, and I will overpay out the ass for him if I have to. Yeah, the only trade I ever made that – I don't want to say made somebody look foolish because they still got a good asset out of it – is when I had my ESPN insider, Cali Dog 304 whatever his name is, <laughs> tell me that Andrew Luck's calf was all messed up. I traded Andrew Luck, Jacoby Brissett, and DK Metcalf for Baker Mayfield, which isn't awful. But then I flipped Baker Mayfield for Kyler, a second, two-thirds, and a fourth. Oh, yeah, after I remember that. that. Oh, yeah, I think everybody great. does because that's all I talk about at this point. <laughs> uh, after that terrible preseason game, I just threw out an offer. It happened to land in my favor, and I, I still think I have Kyler Murray in that league. I didn't win at all, which was very disappointing, but that was probably my best trade I ever made. I don't – like Mike said, it's it's tough to go out there and just throw offers that heavily favor you because then people don't want to trade with you. Unless you're Scott. <coughs> Scott, uh, but Scott, yeah. Scott, it's Scott, the godfather. Well, Scott is, like, so polite with it. He'll just, like, come up to you and say, he's, hey, he's the hey best, Ashton, man. I just sent you the best trade you've ever seen. It's basically a Christmas gift in the middle of January, in the yeah, middle Scott. of whatever month he sends it to you, and then all of a sudden you blink, and he has Ezekiel Elliott and Lamar Jackson on his roster, and the only thing <laughs> Kobe Scott's a legend, man. Scott is the GOAT. Uh, Dude, God, he's, God, like, God, the God. Grinch. He just takes gifts. He is, <laughs> he is something else, but I don't want to disparage him. We're going to move on to the next question. It is from our man or woman i don't know n Perez 24 i hope i pronounced that right he or she asks is the alpha wide receiver a dying breed i don't know how you interpret this mike but i think a lot of people picture an alpha receiver as calvin johnson somebody who's like 6'3 to 6'5 225 pounds around there just runs a 4-3 like a julio jones in that yeah. sense not that I think it's dying, but I think the NFL is changing more to the Debo Samuel, the DJ Moore, yeah. those type of guys that are a little bit smaller and thicker that can do more after the catch, not just at the catch point or prior to the catch. And I think in that sense, I guess the alpha wide receiver is dying. But then again, guys like that are going to see 120, 130, 140 targets a year. So I don't think wide receivers are dead. I don't think you should just pass on a guy like Michael Thomas or Tyreek Kill because you think the the sense of the word alpha isn't there anymore these guys are still going to be fed there are other guys who don't fit this mold at all that are just big slot receivers or like medium-sized slot receivers like a tyler boyd who's gonna see like 140 targets so that's that's what i think of it there's a question later on talking about like why we think wide receiver production fell off but i take it as differently so i take it as like the target hog wide receiver so the Mm -hmm. guys that get like 160 170 targets a year is that a dying breed and um, I mean, the data shows that it is. I think uh, JJ Zach Rice and at Lay Round QB on Twitter, uh, in one of his podcasts, I don't remember what episode it was, but he he like covered it in pretty good detail. And like you just see, you see that the targets are being dispersed throughout the NFL. Like, why is wide receiver so deep, right? Wide receiver is so deep because the targets are being dispersed. So there's more wide receiver twos uh, that, and there's more wide receiver twos and more wide receiver threes than like ever before. And that's why you can wait on wide receiver. Uh, the guys like like Julio Jones, the guys like Megatron, they're just like they're just like very very rare nowadays. And is that because we haven't had a generational type talent, uh, regardless of what everyone keeps saying Jerry Judy is, come into the league? Uh, probably. I mean, we haven't seen a Megatron. We haven't seen a Julio Jones. We haven't even seen an AJ Green in a long time. You know, those guys. We've seen a DK Metcalf. You know, we've seen guys like that, but those are still second round picks, right? We haven't seen that like elite top 10 round, like first round wide receiver. That's just some like respect an to Mike Williams' animal. name. Sixth overall. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Have you seen his player profiler? Mike Williams is, is far from a beast. So uh, <laughs> I wouldn't call him that. But yeah, I mean, I think he's undervalued, but let's get to that later. But yeah, I think that at the target hog wide receiver. The alpha wide receiver from a fantasy perspective, I think, is a dying breed because, because the NFL is dispersing. Like, you just you see it. Like, targets are being dispersed. Uh, therefore, volume is being dispersed. And, you know, what correlates most with fantasy production is volume, right? So, if volume is going away and being spread out more, that means we should also be spreading out our, our fantasy assets more. And that's why I advocate for trading back and I advocate for getting deeper rosters because you know there is more deeper plays it's just like how just like how the workhorse running back is a dying breed right we kind of see the exact same thing going on with with wide receiver 
But at the same time, it makes those wide receivers even more valuable, right? It makes the Devontae Adams, the Michael Thomases. Like, there's only, like, three or four of them now, right? You're not – so they do provide uh, some of, somewhat of an edge. But, you know, at the same time, it comes down to positional scarcity. scarcity. So I do think it's a dying breed. Uh, you know, maybe next year uh, in 2021 we get a couple of uh, – couple new megatrons and julio jones but until we kind of see that uh, i think we're we're kind of going to be stuck in the zone where we have a super deep wide receiver class from like 15 to 30 yeah and i think i need to kind of change my perspective on wide receivers like an aj brown he's somebody that i listed as a sell high because of the lack of volume he sees in that offense Mm -hmm. but you think about it right even though it's a lack of volume the way he's being used is one of like for a rookie you don't see teams really cater their offense around a rookie Obviously, Derrick Henry is like the main focal point of that offense, but the way he was being used fit his skill set perfectly. Same with Debo Samuel. So I, I like what you said there, Mike, that like these guys aren't seeing 140 targets. There aren't as many big time alpha receivers anymore. Even if they're seeing limited work and volume, their efficiency is going to make up for that. So maybe I do need to change my outlook on these guys like AJ Brown and Debo Samuel yeah. going forward. I've changed a bit on AJ Brown, to be honest. And it just comes down to like, I just don't see that offense being able to do what it did again, right? Like just being able to grind out the clock and throw like 15, 20 times a game. Like that's just so rare. And like things have to go so well for them. Like they literally scored on every single drive and look, Derrick Henry is great. He's a beast. Right. But at the end of the day, like I think that, 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 that offense is going to pass more than people think. And because of that, I think AJ Brown's obviously the number one there. I don't think he's going to be nearly as efficient as he was this year, but I think he's going to get a lot more volume to make up for it. Move on to the next question. We have Saucy Peen. He asks, is simply being young overrated? Uh, I think in Dynasty, it's very important that you consider age, but I also think a lot of people don't really know the ages of many players, which is why I'll tweet out like once a week just some random thing about a player not being as old as we think. Like Michael Thomas is a year younger than Robert Woods, if you were to ask like a hundred people at the NFL draft, just walking on the street, how old Michael Thomas was and how old Robert Woods was, I bet they'd say 25 and then like 34. Like people don't really look yeah. into, like it's one of the easiest yeah. things to search and like research, but not many people really know the age of players and they weigh their rankings because of ages without really knowing the disparity between two different players. Yeah. I think, you know, flip it up, flip it the other way and say like, is age, like is our age older veterans undervalued? And I'd say almost certainly they're undervalued. Uh, but the key is like, there's a difference, like the difference between how I draft versus how I trade, right? Because in the draft, I'm not sure yet if I'm competing, punting, what I'm doing. So I like to be flexible. So at the top, but at the top of my draft, I'm going to go for younger guys, right? But when I'm, when I've already established myself, right? And I know I'm a competitive team or I know I'm a rebuilding team. If I'm a competitive team, I'm always going for veterans. Like I just, we just, I just traded for, uh, Robert Woods and the Flay of the Public. And I think it was, a, it was a good deal for both sides. But like those types of transactions uh, are always beneficial where like you have a team that's rebuilding and a team that's uh, going for it. You can always get veterans production for like a decent price because to the rebuilding team, they're just not worth as much, right? Because they're not trying to compete. All those points do is make them get a higher pick, which is bad at the end of the day. But for a competing team, it's good. So I think it's, it's very different how you approach things, whether you're in a draft you want to maintain flexibility. That's why you choose youth at the top of the draft. But if someone falls far enough, like if you see Julio fall in the sixth round, I mean, just take them, right? It's really that easy. But when you're trading for them, once you're in a league for like, and you're in your second year and your third year, always try and target those veterans, man. Because like when I'm on the clock on rookie drafts, especially in the tail end of the first, I will always happily give up one of my rookie picks to get like a proven veteran, even if they're older, because to buy on that age discount. Yeah, it's so easy to acquire these older guys because not to rag on Scott again, but there was a time when I was trying to trade him Mike Evans. And I believe he's 26 years old. He's like, oh, I don't like to buy guys that are heading into the latter part of their career. But when you think about it, right, these guys are 26. If you sold Julio Jones at 26 years old, you missed out on what, like five wide receiver one seasons. And I'm not comparing those two guys talent wise, because obviously Julio Jones is one of the best receivers of all time. But a guy like Mike Evans, or even like you said, a Robert Woods, what is he, 28? He's playing, he's not like this big athletic freak that relies on his speed or anything to win in whatever coverage he's facing. He's just a good receiver. I could easily see him being a fringe wide receiver one for the next two years and then be very valuable thereafter, just being like a wide receiver too. So as Mike said, when you are in the draft, I think it's important to hit on the youth because it gives you the flexibility to either rebuild or trade those assets for younger guys if you end up having an older core like I did in the NYC league where I ended up in like the seventh round, the whole flip script on uh, the whole script 
flipped on me. That's a tongue twister and I completely messed it up. But uh, yeah, that's, that's a very good strategy to go into. And people just, they don't like seeing the age of like 27 or 28 by anybody's name, even wide receivers, which we know have a longer shelf life than most running backs. So uh, that's a good arbitrage play is to just buy them because nobody really wants to have them when they're perceived to be old, even though their shelf life is still continuing to provide value. Like, that's like, that's just so true. I, I think like, honestly, like Scott's a godly trader, I think, but he also <laughs> takes it like to the way extreme where like he will literally fade, honestly, like fade, start fading value and making like, uh, and going super heavy on youth, right? Like he did for, was it what it, what it do dynasty or something? Like it, there was, there were some, there were some draft picks, but it was like crazy, like how much he was fading, like age, like as if like, like these guys were literally going to become lepers next year. So yeah, I think you went I, to, uh, I, yeah. J.K. Dobbins like late second, which I like J.K. Dobbins, yeah. but that's kind of yeah. I mean that look, that's not even like it was later on when he was like taking like super like young tight ends and just completely fading production. Uh, and like the, you got to like you got to strike a balance, right? Like so, you know sometimes you punt your one. I do it too. I do it too. So that's why I understand where Scott's coming from. Um, but you got to you got to like find a balance. You can't you can't take it to like the complete extreme where you just like totally fade vets because at the end of the day in season when guys are competing you can still sell those guys. There's still a sell window that that's existing. So don't take it to the crazy extremes where like you're literally fading almost guaranteed production that you can flip for future picks in season for like very unproven guys. I think you got to take a more balanced approach. That's that's what I try to do as well. So yeah, just make sure just make sure you strike a balance, man. Just like be just be fucking water. Like Bruce Lee says, like you should live like I live by this in like in not just in life, but also in fantasy. Like be water. You have to be flexible and see what people are doing in the draft and you have to pivot. And continuing on the trend of picking value, we have Big Spence asking, How do you know when to take value that has fallen to you? I had a draft today where I took Hill at twelve instead of a running back. Uh, I'll kick this over to you, Mike, at first, because I realized for the other like three or four questions, I just kind of went on for two minutes without letting <laughs> you speak. Um, look, I, I think you have to like just understand who you're drafting with, right? And I think, you know, if you're in a BDG league, obviously they're going to follow more or so along the lines of like what Noah and I or, or Nick say. So they're going to be very running back heavy. And even in other leagues, I've started seeing this now where like, you know, I wrote the draft guide, obviously, and I wrote the Bible and I meant every word of it when I wrote it. Um, but I think I'm seeing a trend now where like the elite wide receivers are following it a bit, a bit too far. Uh, you know, guys like guys like Hill, uh, you know, I think should be going in the first round where at, at least by the second round and I'm seeing him fall to like the late second. So when these elite guys are falling, like we got, we got Chris Godden, what in the third, right? Yeah, I think it was like in the or late third. Devonte Adams went one pick before us. So when guys like Adams and Hill and, and Godwin are falling into the third round, you just have to click the buy button. Uh, and I know I say fade wide receiver, but at the end of the day, like you, your goal should still be to draft good players and elite players. And you just don't let elite players fall that low. And, you know, as much as we think all these running backs are going to hit, uh, especially the rookie ones, you know, some of them are inev inevitably going to bust. And at the end of the day, like if you look at like year to year stability, like the wide receiver position does tend to be more stable. So uh, I take value. It's different. Like in the first round, right. You know, if someone falls like five or six spots, I think that's a lot of value and I'll make a move and I'll trade up for like someone like Sean Watson falls at the end of the first, I'll trade up to get him every single time. Um, but you know, once you get into later rounds, I start looking at like, okay, well, you know, maybe if he's falling like a full round, so it just depends on where you are in the drafts early on in the draft. It's all about like tier breaks. Right. So I think that's how you deal with it. You got to talk about tier breaks. Yeah. And I think the more drafts you're a part of even mock drafts, which we'll touch on, I think in tomorrow's video, uh, the more, the more experience you have, you'll start to understand where players are going around. And not to sound like all high and mighty, but you you kind of just know when a player is a value, right? When you see a Robert Woods in the eighth or ninth round or Devontae Parker in that range, and even in the NYC league, I was in the seventh round building a young core, and I had Zach Ertz and Keenan Allen on the board, and I believe a full point PPR and then a, or a half point, whatever it was, and then tight end premium. And sure, Zach Ertz is a bit older, and sure, Keenan Allen is, what, 28? But when you get guys who are top five for Zach Ertz and top 12 at their position perennially, it's just hard to pass up. And you can't really, at that point, it's hard to justify passing on those guys. So I'd say when you get to the point where you can't really make a case for you to pass on them just because you like a younger guy's upside a little bit better, even though it's unknown, I think that's when you know that there's way too much value there. As for Hill at 12, I agree. I think he is very close to being like the wide receiver one in Dynasty because of his age and because of the quarterback he is tied to. He is my wide uh, receiver one. He's your number one? Yeah, he's my wide receiver one. 
Oof, big moves, Mike. Uh, so I don't, I don't think that's like too much of a reach because there's obviously like guys like Nick Chubb and Joe Mixon you can rationalize ahead of him. But yeah, J- uh, Tyreek Hill, wherever you can get him at and around the end of the first or mid second, early second, whatever it is, I think it's a good pick. So I, I definitely don't think you reached there if you're nervous that that was the case. Uh, next up, we have DM9219. He asks, how do you decide which second year players are by lows? Also, is the reason for the drop in this year's wide receiver production because teams are spreading the ball out more? Uh, I think touching on the first one for me, looking at like wide receivers, right? You can target a Nikhil Harry or a Paris Campbell. I think what you want to do is target guys that their value dropped for reasons beyond them not being good or talented, right? Like Nikhil Harry last year, his value dropped because he was hurt the entire year. And obviously the quarterback switch definitely hurts, but you weren't picking Nikhil Harry at the 102, the 103 in your rookie drafts last year, thinking Tom Brady was going to be there for another 10 years. You knew a quarterback change was eminent imminent, eminent, I don't know the word. And so I think he is a good buy because a lot of people are valuing him as like a mid to late second round rookie pick for this year. And I believe if he was in this class, he would easily easily be like a surefire first round pick. So I think he is a good guy to buy. Uh, even like a JJ Sega white side, obviously he didn't do much of anything despite a very shallow wide receiver core. You look at the fact that you can get him for like a third round rookie pick, like a late one or even like a fourth because people when they're on the clock just want, you know, whoever the hell is out there in the fourth round. So I think that's a good enough buy opportunity. Paris Campbell, I know you're lower on and I'm a little bit lower on than most, but again, like he was injured most of his rookie year. He had a quarterback that we thought was, we thought it was me, Andrew Luck. It didn't happen. Jacoby Brissett was there and people were still high on Paris Campbell. Now they have a guy that likes to pepper the slot. So maybe he's somebody you want to throw a third round pick at and try to invest in. But that's typically what I like to go for when I'm buying second year players. It didn't really prove much in the rookie year because most of the time, they most rookie wide receivers don't do much in their rookie year, and I think we were kind of spoiled by the AJ Browns, the Debo's, and the DKs uh, this past season. Yeah, I have a little bit different approach. Um, like Harry's just someone that I'm just gonna stand for till I die, so he's uh, like completely rational and just uh, for reason why I, I like him. And you know, a lot of it has to do with his profile. A lot of it has to do with what I saw from him in college. Um, like that type of a profile receiver just doesn't come along very often. So that's why I'm still on the Harry train. And like you said, there's a reason, there's reasons why he struggled, but you know, part of it is also because he wasn't good last year. Like there's no hiding that he just wasn't very good at separating. He wasn't very good when he's on the field. And part of that is, you know, Tom Brady doesn't trust the guy, right? Like they don't, that's not a good mesh. Like Tom Brady wants guys that know exactly where they need to be, where they want to be. Nikhil Harry's like a playmaker where like a little bit of wild card, you just get him the ball in space. So I, I agree. I think he's a good buy low because of how cheap it is. I've been buying him a lot of places. Um, JJ Arcega, I said, I'm, I'm basically off of now just because like, there's, I just can't explain why he was so bad other than the fact that he's probably bad because he couldn't like do anything in an offense that had literally like had like Greg Ward, like future, like probably practice squad slash grocery baggers coming in and, and, and producing. Um, so uh, for wide receivers, look, I think, I think I'm going to fade the guys that like bust and fall like entirely on their face. I'm not really buying low on those guys anymore, unless it's someone like Harry. Um, so guys like Hakeem Butler, who I was never high on, uh, even like uh, Paris Campbell, like he was injured. I get it. Uh, but I was just never high on him to begin with. Uh, so I'm just like not going to invest in him. Uh, Is- Isabella, another one who I, who I was like actually pretty high on who fell on his face. Like these types of guys, I'm just not not buying them anymore. What I'm looking for is guys that like had some sort of production and some sort of efficiency, even though so you got to look past the counting stats, right? So someone, an example of this would be Christian Kirk. So Christian Kirk, I was buying this year, last year, and I'm still buying this year. If you looked at his stats from year one as a rookie, not very impressive at all, right? Like what is like 500 something yards, uh, 600 something yards. And, you know, but if you dig into it, his efficiency on a yards per run base is actually pretty good. And then if you think about the context of what the situation was, he was placed in a situation with Josh Rosen, who obviously was doomed to fail and just wasn't very good to begin with. Um, But despite all of that, he was able to produce. And then this year again, you know, he, the counting stats went up, but the efficiency dropped. And we look at why, like he had a, I believe it was a high ankle sprain or like a yeah, ankle, like an ankle injury. Ankle. Yeah, an ankle injury. But now he's going into his second year with Kyler Murray. Uh, you know, he had a new coach last year, second year with that coach, second year in the system. Uh, and then, you know, gets DeAndre Hopkins alongside him, which I think is a good thing because I think Christian Kirk is going gonna, is gonna to take that next leap as the second wide receiver. He's not really prototyped as an alpha wide receiver. Um, so those are the types of guys I look for. Someone that had like momentum, uh, especially late in the season. Uh, going into next year that are not getting valued appropriately because people are very excited about rookies. So, you know, it's going to be really hard to do 
this for next for next year because all the wide receivers really produce. You know, Terry McLaurin, AJ Brown, DK Metcalf, like all the hype is already there. So it's very hard to find that second year uh, producer. Uh, I would say, you know, one place you could look could be David Montgomery. I mean, I was never his a big fan of his. I'm still not a really big fan of his because I think he has major holes in his game, but he's someone that has volume and actually put up a okay-ish season. And he's basically going off at like very discount prices. So I'm comfortable throwing a couple darts there. Uh, not to say I'm all in, but I think those are the types of trends I look for. Wow, Mike, you you had me reeled in when you're talking about Christian Kirk, and then you brought up Dave Montgomery, and I was all out. <laughs> wow. But yeah, I, I like what you're saying there. Look at look at the efficiency stats. Even though Andy Isabella had that one like 88 yard touchdown, which definitely helped his yards yeah. per route run, because he probably ran like three routes, and that was one of them. So uh, yeah. maybe don't look too in depth on him. But uh, touching on the Arizona Cardinals wide receiver group, the second part of this question has, actually has to do with teams spreading the ball out more, and maybe that was the reason for the wide receiver production dipping last year. I was looking at the production last year, and I believe Nick brings up in a lot of videos, like if Kenny Galladay had his numbers from last year, the year prior, he would have been like the wide receiver 12 or something. I also think you have to look at how many guys were really injured last year that were perennial top 12 or you know top 15 guys. Adam Thielen had a hamstring injury. Antonio Brown, we all know that guy kind of went crazy. He wasn't even in the league for most of the season. Yep. Mark Cooper had his inconsistencies. Juju Smith-Schuster was hurt. Big Ben was hurt. Yep. Mike Evans got hurt a few games. Brandon Cooks, his head almost fell off. Odell was on a new team and T.Y. Hilton was hurt. So I don't think it's obviously as teams spread the ball out more, there is going to be less volume. And if you don't improve your efficiency, the points aren't going to be there. But I think there are enough good receivers in the NFL for it to bounce back from last year where it was kind of an anomaly when you look at how many top end wide receivers and how many quarterbacks really got injured, whether it be Stafford, Cam Newton, Big Ben. Uh, so that's where my head is at there. I don't think wide receivers are just like dead the entire wide receiver group is a dying breed but uh it, you should also go back to our previous point that you know mike brought up with jj zacharyson that these alpha receivers may not really be a thing in the very near future next yep. up we have b Gendza. i cannot pronounce any of these names he asks out of the top five running backs off the board in rookie drafts so i assume it's jonathan taylor Clyde edwards alaire deandre swift cam Akers, jk dobbins Who's most likely to bust and be worthless a year or two down the road? Mike, I know you love Jonathan Taylor. I know you've kind of turned on J.K. Dobbins to love him a little bit more. So who do you think is going to bust, if any of them? Man, that's a tough question. I mean, I, I said this, you know, even back in, way before the draft. If I were to pick one that's most likely to bust, it would be Cam Akers. And even though I love Cam Akers, um, the reason is just because like, he's just so raw, right? He's so raw. And that's like, he's so raw. He, he's not a great uh, elite processor, I guess, at the line, at least from what I saw, he definitely makes mistakes there, but he also has like one of the highest ceilings of the class. And that's like, I think that's a fair take, right? Because it's all about risk reward trade-off, right? Like, what are you chasing? If you're chasing the ceiling, like I think Cam Akers has it and he has it as good as any of them in this draft. Um, but he also has the highest risk of them all. So as a cam makers stand, like as a cam makers truthers through and through, like I've been here standing for this man for a long time, I can still recognize his flaws. And, you know, contrary to popular belief, people think we just push cam makers, you know, religiously, like that is one of the risks. So if I were to pick one in terms of like the most likely to bust, it would be cam makers, but I still really, really like him as a prospect. Yeah. I narrowed it down to him and Deandre Swift. I just think the other guys, it's tough for them to ever really lose relevance in these next two years at least in fantasy football because you have Jonathan Taylor running behind that offensive line like that guy Jonathan Williams is a fucking RB1 two weeks in a row <laughs> uh, whoever is tied to Patrick Mahomes is going to be good like people will still be drafting Clyde Edwards Alaire in the second round of redraft leagues as they did with Damian Williams even if the guy has no hamstrings and he's not good J.K. Dobbins with Lamar Jackson it's gonna be hard to pass up so I was between Swift and Akers I let my love for Cam Akers blind me I'm just going DeAndre Swift because I mean, when's the last time we've seen a Lions running back be good? I mean, I, not that I'm afraid he's the next Amir Abdullah or the next on Johnson, because I do think he's probably the most pro-ready running back of all these guys because he can really do it all. And he's in a situation where he's probably going to earn the starting job right away. But I just worry about the quarterback longevity there. Obviously, Matt Stafford has played through injuries in the past, but there's some concern with his back there. Uh, their offensive line, I believe they lost two offensive linemen. They signed a new guy, but the continuity isn't quite there. They have on Johnson, and I'm not sure that they're going to want to go with a bell cow. So I don't think 
in terms of losing value completely over these next two years, I don't think it's going to happen because people still want to buy youth at the running back position. People are still drafting Tariq Cohen out there for whatever the fucking reason. That is. <laughs> so uh, I don't think any of these guys are bad investments because they probably will maintain their value for at least one full season. But if I were to lean on one guy to be a quote unquote bust, I'd probably have to say DeAndre Swift. I just, he's going to be AJ Brown. He's going to prove me wrong with that landing spot. So <laughs> I'm just not going to talk about him anymore because I don't want to be completely wrong. Next up, we have Kenny WS. He asks, how much does a full point tight end premium actually increase the value of tight ends? Mike, you've touched on this before. I believe you yeah. said the top guys are just fucking elite. Yeah, we can, we can probably combine the next, next question as well. The next question is from The Doc is Back. He says, where should top tight ends be falling in tight end premium leagues? Half PPR, super flex, where tight ends score one point. So one concept that people need to understand is you need to think about it in terms of the multiplier, right? So... If you're in a half PPR and a tight end gets one, P- one full point PPR, that's more valuable than a tight end getting 1.5 PPR and a full point premium. Uh, so, and it's more equivalent to a full PPR where a tight end gets two PPR. So uh, uh, you got to think about it that way in terms of multiplier because that's what like creates the gap between the elite guys and the non-elite guys. So I've said this before and i say it again, like elite guys should be valued appropriately. So Kittle should be a first rounder. Um, and I think, honestly, I think Andrews, Andrews, I have Andrews ahead of Kittle just because of the age, even though Kittle, I mean, even though, sorry, not ahead of Kittle, sorry, ahead of Kelsey, even though Kelsey will probably outscore him this year. I just think the youth there is too much to pass up. Like it's like getting Kelsey, like at the beginning of Kelsey's hype uh, in terms of his age. So I I think Andrews should be going in the second round. Um, And then beyond that, I think this year's, I mean, a little bit unique, right? Because before I would, I would have said like, look, after that, you just fade everyone. Uh, and then you wait till the late rounds. And that's kind of what people are doing. So you don't have to draft them early yet because based on BDG ADP, I think a lot of these uh, tight ends are still a little bit undervalued. Guys like Waller, guys like Ertz, guys like, um, what do you Tyler call Higby. it? Evan yeah, Ingram Tyler, is still pretty undervalued. E- Evan Ingram as well. Like they're following into the late, late uh, single digit round. So I think in tight end premium formats, you can kind of click those guys before you get your like wide receiver two or wide receiver three. Cause I think at the end of the day, they're going to score a lot better. But I do think that from the BDG ADP that we saw, I think that elite tight ends are, are undervalued. And we kind of brought up Kittle as if someone was undervalued, even though he's tight end one, but he's going in like the late second round. So I think if you're getting him in the mid second, like that's great value. If you're getting him in the late second, I think that's a steal because the tight end longevity is really is, is a lot longer than uh, running backs and, and even wide receivers. But more importantly, the scoring advantage that Kittle provides over the next like high scoring tight ends is actually pretty massive. Yeah. And if we're talking about a full tight, a uh, full point tight end premium where like a wide receiver gets half a point and a tight end gets 1.5, they get an extra on top of that. I mean, a guy like George, George Kittle should be, you know, a top five, six pick. You look at what he did last year. If he got that additional full point on top of a half PPR, and you compare it to Michael Thomas, he would have averaged more fantasy points per game. Travis Kelsey would have also outscored Michael Thomas last year in what was a very historic receiving season for Michael Thomas. So in that type of setting, those elite tight ends, like Mark Andrews should be an early second round pick there, even though he's not the biggest reception type of guy. But, yeah. you know, the scarcity at the position is much more serious and much more drastic yeah. than even quarterbacks uh, in a super flex league. So you have to you have to value them accordingly. And on top of that, even in – you know, the multiplier where it's like just two times, right? If it's half PPR, the tight end gets an extra half. So they get one full point PPR. I think a good play is to target some older guys a little bit later. Whereas instead of picking like a wide receiver four or wide receiver five on their own team, not even on your roster, uh, you should go with a guy like a Jared Cook, right? There aren't many like old guys that I'm fans of this year aside from Jared Cook, but like last year, somebody like a Greg Olson, a Delaney Walker, Jason Wynn, two of those three gave you some pretty good weeks last season and you're getting them in rounds where you're picking players that will probably be cut for you, you know, before the season even starts. So I think in tight end premium leagues, picking older guys that will give you immediate production, but might not have the longevity that other players you perceive to have in that range uh, give you will, they'll provide you good flex plays throughout the season. If you have a deep roster and need somebody to throw out there like Jared Cook this upcoming season, will probably make your starting roster almost every single week just because he's on the Saints and he's a main target of Drew Brees. Yeah, and we'll fold another question into here. You know, D Patel 35 asks, when doing the rebuild first-year strategy in startup, how beneficial is it to secure a young tight end, mainly either Kittle or Andrews? I think, you know, we talked about tight end premium. I think in non-tight end premium, I find tight ends to be undervalued. Uh, and sorry, not not all tight ends, but the elite ones because – 
Like I, when I'm starting a punt year one, like rebuild, productive struggle, whatever you want to call it, I usually want to secure the tight end position because that's like one hole where you can kind of plug and then just ride similar to quarterback. You can ride them for a long time, except, uh, except like different from quarterback. There's only like five or six of them, right? There's only really five or six of them in any given year. And in some years, only two or three of them in any given year that you really feel comfortable starting like every single weekend. So having that like roster slot, like basically locked and loaded, it creates a lot of like other, you know, tangential benefits, which may not be realized in points, but like, you know, roster slots, like roster cloggers, like otherwise you're literally like holding like four or five tight ends and just cycling them through and through to try and like piece together uh, a tight end, a tight end uh, one season. So I think that in, in non tight end premium, even like, like guys like Kittle and Andrews are great pieces to build around uh, over like a young wide receiver. Yeah. It's such a scarce position. Like every single year, there's going to be one to two to three quarterbacks coming into the league that are ha- going to have a starting job. They're picked early in rookie drafts for tight ends, right? This past year, the earliest one you're probably taking is Adam Troutman or Cole Komet in like the late third round the year prior, even like a TJ Hawkinson or Noah Fant, they were seen as almost generational talents. I know that word is thrown around a ton, but they were seen as that coming out of Iowa. And even now, right, they're being picked around the like, late single-digit rounds because people are nervous because they didn't produce right away. Getting a tight end that is both young and has been productive at a young age is a huge advantage because in dynasty leagues, you're not able to stream off the waiver wire. Most leagues have like 15 to 20 bench spots. And even the worst tight ends in the world, like a Foster Moreau, who's going to do you no good, is locked up on somebody's taxi squad or on their bench. So it's very hard to get reliable tight end production in your lineup if you don't have one of these guys and just the scarcity of the position the lack of elite tight ends coming to the league year after year I believe 2021 has a few good prospects I don't really know too well I believe that guy Pitts uh, is pretty good but yeah but even then like if he doesn't produce year one year without two by the way not 2021 2022 there you go no no, 2020 yeah 2021 sorry yeah 2021 either way he's not going to produce till 2022 so it doesn't really matter the tight end position is so scarce I think you got to if you have the opportunity to get a Kittle or Andrews definitely draft them but if you are most likely if you are rebuilding from the startup draft you probably traded like picks in rounds one through three or four so they probably won't be available to you you do not want to be in a position where you're relying on rookie drafts to fill the tight end position that is not a pretty sight to be in like think about all the people that overdrafted gaseki trash right and then like who like who were the best ones to come out of the class like mark andrews right like and mark andrews like at this point to me mark andrews is a like no miss like player so i'm totally comfortable paying the premium for andrews because in my eyes it's like buying kittle before kittle was kittle it's like buying kelsey before kelsey was kelsey and like the other thing is like i've said this many times but like you you just understand like the simple economics of scarcity right like if you have two to three really good tight ends that are startable and another young tight end as well like a lot of my rosters i have like andrews uh plus like higby plus like a young guy like Fant or or like uh, Hawkinson right and the reason why I have them there is because like if I can lock up you know two three of like a possible eight starters in a league of 12 people who are they going to come to when they need to trade for tight ends there's only one person right because it's like it's like quarterbacks super flex you can only trade one away if you have one and if most people don't have two tight ends because there aren't that many good starting tight ends to have so that's a really really easy position to create scarcity yeah and in the startup draft it's like it's the worst feeling when you pick a tight end. You're like, man, that was the unsexiest pick of all time. But then week four, when somebody's trotting out Jason Witten, who's playing second fiddle to Darren Waller, they're going to come crawling to your doorstep. You get to throw your backup tight end out there and get a good haul in return, especially in super, in tight end premium leagues, because people view tight ends at such a lower value than quarterbacks in super flex leagues. Even if it's a tight end premium league, which I personally don't understand because a lot of the time, even like a Hunter Henry is outscoring some of your wide receivers on a week-to-week basis. So they carry a ton of value, even if it's just like a half point on top of a half point for normal uh, running back and wide receiver receptions. So we also have Codine asking how we feel about Dallas Goddard heading into the season healthy uh, with the healthy Zach Ertz, uh, Deshaun Jackson, and Jalen Rager. I was about to say he probably isn't heading into the season healthy after he took that hit in the bar. I don't know what the hell happened there, but that was a scary sight. You got knocked the fuck out, man. Yeah, dude, that was crazy. He just, like, pushed the guy back, and he was just out cold in a matter of a second. But 
the thing about Zach or, or Dallas Goddard to me is I was never buying him or drafting him expecting 2020 to be his year to be a an elite tight end one. He was a tight end one last year, but anything after like tight end seven is a fraud, so I don't really care. Um, but I, I think it doesn't really matter if Jackson is healthy, if Jalen Rager is added to this offense and Zach Ertz is still there. He carved out a role last year, and I think the reason why you're buying him is for him to replace Zach Ertz. And sure, they added Jalen Rager, who is probably going to be that alpha receiver in that offense. And Dallas Goddard will probably never have the ceiling as Zach Ertz had. But you look at the system he's in with Doug Peterson, who came from the Andy Reid coaching tree, who had a young Travis Kelsey up and coming in that offense. And they started to pepper him with targets despite other weapons being around there. I think after Zach Ertz is gone, Dallas Goddard is going to be a perfectly fine player for you. Probably like a top five or six tight end in Dynasty because he's a little bit older. But as we've touched on, like the tight end shelf life is a lot older than we think. Like, fucking Jason Witten was top 12 last year, being a year removed from football, not looking good at all. I think he's he's somebody that I'm still buying. I'm not worried that they added more weapons. I think it helps balance out that offense because last year, it was it was abysmal watching them try to drop back and throw. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, there aren't many, like, tight end handcuffs, but Dallas Goddard is one. If Ertz goes down, I think he's an immediate top five, like, producing tight end. But, you know, at the same time, like, you should not be overpaying for, for handcuffs, right? I mean, he's, he's definitely, you know, Ertz is going to be there for a couple of years, I think, to be honest. And, you know, there's been talk in the offseason about Ertz getting extended uh, from some of the, I guess, the Eagles reporters. Uh, we have yet to see that happen. But if that happens, then, like, Dallas Goddard's value, like, really plummets even more. So I'd be careful, like, investing, like, high amounts in Goddard. Like, look, I love the talent. You know, he's a great, great player um, and pretty efficient. But I think you got to be risk. You got to be comfortable, like sitting on him for like one, maybe two, maybe even three years before he really, really steps up and takes that elite, that elite status. And I think, you know, at at his prices right now, it's a little bit, it's a little bit tough. You know, sometimes you can get him for cheap, but every other league I'm in, like, there's that like Dallas Goddard tight end one truther that just takes him like ahead of like Hawkinson and like, and all these guys who actually have a real shot of, of being a starting tight end. Yeah, and that kind of transitions i'll try to transition it to our man dylan joy's question where he says what's your preferred dynasty approach the wide receivers provide longevity but the heavy hitting rbs are a necessity for winning championships it can be difficult to get both so you can get like a dallas goddard you know the eighth or ninth round and i think next week we're gonna be touching on like the best strategy to go into a draft basically mike's bible but in video form but we're not gonna go as in depth because as people say the book is always better than the movie and mike put a lot of hard work into the bible <laughs> So uh, I think it's both of our strategies to, if you're in the position to do so, grab those running backs early because spending a fifth, sixth, seventh round pick on a Melvin Gordon, a Todd Gurley, a Leonard Fournette, I mean, it doesn't give you much longevity and it gives you like middling RB2 production for a year or two. I think if you are at the back end of the first round and you can get like a Joe Mix and Nick Chubb stack and get those Allen Robinsons, those DJ Charks, those Calvin Ridleys in the mid rounds, and in between those, pair it with like a Carson Wentz in the third, a Matt Stafford in the sixth or seventh. I think that gives you a good enough opportunity to not only be a win now team, but also have longevity because most of those guys that I named, aside from like Matt Stafford, are pretty young and they have, you know, three to five year windows. The running backs are probably three to five year windows. Those wide receivers probably have like five to 10 years of wide receiver two, wide receiver three type of production, which I'll take any day of the week in like the sixth or seventh round. Yeah, I think, you know, I hate when people make like the longevity argument because like one, it's not even that true. Like people make it sound like wide receivers last twice as long as running backs when in reality it, they don't because it takes them like two to three years to like develop and like actually like come full steam and ramp up. Whereas like running backs kind of hit the ground running. So you kind of already have a lead and then also like running back values accrue more. So look like longevity is, is like, to me, it's like, is like playing not to lose. Right. Like I, I always play to win and, because of that, like I'll have like a, a bigger variance in terms of like how, how my teams do and I'll either smash or, or like, I'll just go into a rebuild. And I think, I think that's the way to play Like right? Otherwise you like kind of get stuck in the middle and the middle ground is like not really where you want to be. Like the way, the way I think about it is like, I'm not worried about longevity because I would have cycled my roster like two to three times by the time this guy's career over. Like I don't draft someone being like, Oh yeah, fuck yeah. Like I'm going to have that guy for 12 years. Like, I don't care. Like I'm going to just Dude. play the market and see the value accrue over time. In the filet, the public league, Yannick and I share a team and we were talking about a player like, Oh, you wanted Devonte Adams here? 
I'm like, he's 27. I don't know. We're kind of going young. He's like, who the fuck cares? He's not going to be on our roster in week three. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah exactly. Make so many trades. Like, I get what you're saying. The longevity argument isn't always the best argument because most of the time the team you draft in your startup is probably going to be all gone before the season even begins. <laughs> yeah, that's, I just think like, yeah, you, I'm, a, I'm a volume trader uh, and I'm a, a pretty big trade active, addict and I like to time and sell, uh, time my sells and buys and, and trade a lot just based on market value and perception of value uh, to try and accumulate try and accumulate wealth and accumulate value onto my team. So like longevity doesn't really come into play for me when it comes, when we're talking about like position versus position, when we're talking about like age, like it comes into play for me because I want guys that, that have a perceived value of longer runway because it contributes their value. And I want to buy increasing assets. I don't want to buy declining assets, but when people make the argument like, Oh, like QBs have more longevity, like, well, wide receivers long more longevity. Like who gives a fuck, man, you're trying to win. Like right now you're trying to win the next two years. Like, like that, I think in my opinion, like, look, just don't, don't be a coward when you play dynasty, right? Like take risks. And like, usually the championship teams are the one that take risks. Uh, don't take unnecessary risks. Like, don't be an idiot, but you got to take risks to win. And I think you got to swing on running backs to actually win championship championships. Moving over to our last question by Cot Cappen. He asks, is the 2021 draft class as good as the 2020 class? Mike, I know you're in a few Debbie leagues, so I'll let you hit on this. But my, my initial reaction is I think the 2021 class is almost as good at, or better at every position except maybe the elite running backs. I think you're right on there. Um, the running backs doesn't really sync up with 2020. And I think overall the depth, the class might not be as deep because if you look at this class, when you're getting guys like KJ Hamler in like the fourth round and third round, that's not going to happen every year. Guys with second round draft capital and like really great profile. So I think this class is very deep. And if you look at it from a, NFL draft capital invested it was probably one of the best classes ever just based on how many people went like by day two like the amount of running backs and wide receivers that went in round one round two was actually pretty insane so from that perspective I'd say it's not as good but if you look at the top of the wide receiver class I think the top of the wide receiver class for 2021 is a lot better than 2020 even after losing Justin Ross and I think the quarterbacks is uh is better by a lot I think just with guys like Justin Fields and Trevor Lawrence leading the way then you got like Trey Lance coming up as well. So I think those two position groups are better. Tight end is obviously better because 2020 was just absolutely ass. And you got when like Cole Kyle Komet Pitts. Is seen as the best tight end. <laughs> much worse. Yeah. 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 When, when Cole Komets is seen as a consensus tight end, you know, there's something wrong. Um, but you got Kyle Pitts, you got Pat Frymouth, you got uh, Brevin Jordan. So three pretty good tight end prospects. So I think across the board, like aside from running backs, you can say the 2021 class is more top heavy and is more talent at the top. But overall, as a class, I don't think it'll be as deep as the 2020. And then especially with like COVID and all these like seasons and games being lost, like you have no idea how these players are going to develop. Yeah, I'm not sure. Can like Chuba Hubbard still come out this year with that supplemental no. draft? Oh, he no, can't. he can't because you have to, it has to be like a, like a really rare exception. It can't just be like, oh, like I changed my mind and I want to go in the NFL. That's crazy because I know he's having like beef with Mike Gundy and he's still yeah, he yeah. was eligible this past year. So I was wondering if he could come out. But yeah, yeah, as you said, the running back class definitely isn't as deep. They do have some pretty good guys at the top, whether it be Hubbard, Najee Harris and Travis Etienne. Obviously, the landing spot has a ton to do with it. Like we saw this year, like Clyde Edwards Alaire was our consensus RB5. And then he moved up to our RB1 and RB2 because he landed on the Chiefs. So we'll see how that plays out. But I think Mike hit the nail perfectly on the head. The quarterbacks there, we've heard about Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields for the past five years, ever since they were in high school, just throwing dimes. Uh, the wide receivers, the top of the class, like Chase, uh, Rondell Moore, uh, what's his name, Bateman, Rashad Bateman. Yep. Like they, have, they have so many guys that I know, like, analytically I've seen on Twitter. They're, like, LSRL and shit like that is ridiculous. It's better than, like, Juju Smith-Schuster and stuff like that, uh, who I guess isn't somebody who you should compare most elite receivers to after this past season that he put up. But uh, it looks to be a very good class. The tight ends. This past year was a shit show other than our boy, Adam Troutman, so it can't get much worse. This isn't to say just go out there and fucking acquire every single 2021 pick and trade away guys that are proven talents for them, but I think at this point they're pretty cheap and they're cheap enough for you to, at least in the startup draft, move like a seventh, eighth round pick for a 2021 first because yep. even if it is a mid to a late 2021 first, you're getting one of these guys like a Rondo Moore or maybe even a Jamar Chase, so I think that's a good investment to make. Yeah, for sure. I mean, 2021 and even 2022, like I'm, I'm already past 2021. Now. I'm looking at 2022, which is why in the BBB listener league, me and Noah tried to collect all the 2022 picks we had. And in another like Debbie's, uh, not a Debbie, in another 14 team startup league, I think I, I, I left the, the startup draft with like, 
like eight picks, eight first round picks between 2021 and 2022. I think, uh, I think 2022 class is going to be pretty lit as well. So I always buy on the cheap and those assets are guaranteed to increase in value. Like guaranteed, like, like U S government treasury bill, maybe not anymore. Cause Don, Donald Trump's freaking printing money. Like nobody's business, but uh, before, before now, before COVID and before all this stuff, U S treasury bill is probably one of the safest investments ever guaranteed to go up in value. That's how you should view like future rookie picks. So they're guaranteed to increase in value, except the return on them will be much better than the treasury bill. Yeah. I wish I knew a little bit more about treasury bills and shit like that, or else I wouldn't be speaking in the, to this type of mic, but I think, <laughs> I think that's all we got for you guys today. If you guys like this style of video and you like the Q and A's keep dropping them in the discord, which you can join through Patreon. Now it has been closed off which I mean, it's been open for like five months at this point. If you didn't join before, you probably didn't want to join. And if you're upset about not joining, hopefully you're not a new viewer. I hope I'm not like being an asshole right now, but you can join through Patreon. You can drop questions in that channel. I believe it's BBB Q&A. And bi-weekly, Mike, will, Mike and I will hop on, probably answer like four to five questions in a shorter form video that will be exclusive to the Bunk Bed Breakdowns YouTube channel. It'll be linked down below, or you can just type in Bunk Bed Breakdowns and click the one with the beautiful cover art, not the guy like playing his banjo in the bottom of a bunk. Uh, that is definitely not us, although I kind of wish it was me. But All right, before we go, we are doing a draft guide giveaway. Only one because we're not that wealthy. <laughs> if you rate us five stars and you leave a review in the iTunes store, I don't know how to check like Google Play, so it has to be the iTunes store. I'm sorry for you Android users. Uh, next week, we will announce the winner. We will give away the season-long slash dynasty rookie draft guide. So if you want to be entered into the competition, into the sweepstakes, leave a review, screenshot it, send it to us on Twitter. We'll see it anyways, even if you don't do that, but a little bit more engagement would never hurt. So if you want yep. to have the chance to win a draft guide, read Mike's Bible and catch up on what next week's video will be about before you guys get to see it, uh, leave a review. Hopefully not one star, hopefully five star if you guys enjoy, but uh, I think that's all we got for you guys today. Hope you guys enjoy the content. And coming up tomorrow, we have the narrative, a separate video coming out to get more content on the channel. So uh, see you guys later. Have a good one. Peace.